Hey everyone, this is Arif. I just have a quick ask before we get into the show today. If you could just please subscribe to the podcast and whatever player you're listening to this on and leave us a five-star rating and review. That does the absolute most to get our name out there and help people find us. Um, if you're looking for any other way to support the show, you can head over to thelifeofxpodcast.com and uh, click on our support page. All right, thank you. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Eric Tadala. And my name is Melvin Barnes. And this is The Life of X. Who we got today, Melvin? We got the Wilt Chamberlain, the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper. We love Wilt so much, we're recording this twice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for those of you who, who don't know and wouldn't really have any reason to know, this was the first ever podcast episode that Melvin and I recorded, and due to my inability to run sound, we had to record it again. So it's the first ever podcast that we are recording twice. Right, and yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyway, today we've got Wilt Norman Chamberlain, the legend. How much did you know about Wilt before we... Uh, before we did this, uh, I knew a little bit, you know, being a a, a basketball fan. Um, but I will say this: I, I pretty much knew he got buckets. That's but about I didn't it. know he was a much more uh, complex individual. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know much about him before this. Just the obviously the one hundred point game and the 50, 50 points per game average. Nuts. Yeah, but he was a complex figure. All right, so Wilt was born Wilton Norman Chamberlain in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to Olivia Ruth Johnson and William Chamberlain on August 21st, 1936. His parents were uh, lower middle class, and they had a total of 11 children. Nine of them survived through childhood. What was the fourth youngest and uh, was closest throughout his entire life to his younger sister, Barbara? They became close mostly because they ended up going through school together the same grade. Wilt was a year ahead of Barbara initially, but he contracted pneumonia when he was young, and it, it actually almost killed him, but he uh, ended up recovering and just having had missed a year of school, ended up in the same grade as Barbara. So from fourth grade on through high school, they were in the same classes together and they attended Overbrook High School together. And despite his great relationship with Barbara, Wilt was actually a very self-conscious kid. Um, he was really concerned about his height. Uh, I think by the time he was 10, he was already six feet tall. And yeah. when he was, what, eight, in the eighth grade, he was 6'11". And, and people thought he was slow, too, because, of his, because he, was, he was a shy and quiet kid. Yeah, and he also had a, a, a stutter, yeah. which he had to work to kind of to, to get over. But to, to Arab's point, uh, people thought he was slow. So all of this kind of combined to make him a very self-conscious kid. And we also want to mention that, I mean, he's, he's an African-American in the 1950s. And, uh, you know, this is a, a point where a lot of people really just want to really just want to, you know, blend into the crowd. But he's yeah, he's a luck. giant. We, <laughs> you know? I feel like we, we passed over this point a little bit, too. He was six feet tall when he was 10, ten years, years old. old. You haven't even reached six feet yet. Wow. OK. Yeah. Throwing that out there for the you're pod. Almost, you're almost 40. What? <laughs> <laughs> Little, little bit of an overstatement, but, <laughs> but whatever. Okay. Uh, uh, but can you imagine being six feet tall? No, I can't imagine being six feet tall, period. Yeah, you know you can't, but I can. And I can tell you. <laughs> you weren't there when you were 10. No, I wasn't even close to there when I was 10. I was like 5'1", 160. Right. And the craziest thing about all of this is despite his, his phenomenal height, um, Wilt wasn't really drawn to basketball initially. No. He was much more into other, um, ac not academic, but athletic endeavors like cross country, um, not cross country, track. I apologize, track and field, Yeah, uh, where, you know, if he had decided to become a track and field athlete, we have no doubt that he would have dominated uh, track and field, you know, in a similar way that he dominated basketball. He was just a well, I mean, freak he did. athlete. He, he did dominate track and field. Yeah. I mean, what was he was a, he also high jumped, right? What yeah. Was, I mean, he was a high jumper. He I forget what the uh, track events he did, like the running but later, you know, when he was in the NBA, he often talked about quitting to go and be an Olympic decathlete. Yeah. And a lot of people think think he would have done pretty well. I, right? I forget in, in college, he 
not only did the high jump, but he also did, I think he did a long jump, high jump, and like shot put and like ran the 400 or something like that. Like, Nuts. Yeah. I mean, I mean just, can you imagine that? Just like a, freak a athlete. six eleven kid high jumping. Yeah. With coordinated enough to high jump. Yeah. And this was before the days of the 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 backwards high jump too. It was the yeah. one where you kind of roll over the bar. My God. Yeah. And then is the, this gazelle like figure running for you know the four hundred meter. Yeah, I love dash. that. I love that picture of uh, yeah. of him running. He just looks like just like the perfect perfect running man. Just legs, just all legs. Yeah, yeah, nuts. It it is. Oh, before we go any further, I think we should mention that the this episode, most of the information that we got, we picked up from Robert Cherry's book Wilt Larger Than Life. So, anything that you think you'd like more information on information on or more ex- expounded points uh definitely check out cherry's book it's, it's excellent and he goes really in depth with a lot of what we're going to talk about today and also before we move on we also want to point out that despite the fact that he wasn't necessarily initially drawn to basketball he did grow up in philly which you know i think he was west philadelphia born and raised <laughs> on the playground is that where he spent most of his days i think he actually spent them on the uh the, the track the track field yes but uh you know back then you know, Philadelphia, and maybe some people would say this even today, that, but basketball is life in Philadelphia. Yeah. I uh, mean, I feel like today New York is kind of like the mecca of playground whoa, whoa, basketball. Whoa, 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 whoa. What? You going to make a case for Toledo? <sighs> no, I'm not going to make a case for Toledo. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's maybe some, some people in Indiana that would, that would feel differently. Meh. Nah. Nah. I mean, I'm just talking about like in terms of Listen, when you think about when you think when about. When was the last time we had a great player out of New York? I don't know, Marbury. All right, so on that point, uh, back in the what in was those days, a great player out of Indiana, that Hick from French Lick. Okay, Marbury was after him. Yo, but hold, 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 hold up, hold up. I'm hold talking up, about, hold. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about Rucker Park, and all of yeah, the, yeah, look yeah, at yeah, Lance for a Stevenson, bit, for a bit. perhaps right, the goat. Okay. We're moving back to Wilt. <laughs> <laughs> Wilt basically, you didn't have a choice. You were, you were, you were kind of pulled to basketball in Philly in those days, and I think that Philly back then had, you know, maybe a little bit of the a little bit of a claim to be in the basketball capital. Yeah. Um can you imagine if he had played he had grown up in like Oklahoma and had been like and a just, football player? Oh my god. Like fo- or Texas and been like a football player. Yeah. Can you imagine Wilt like as a tight end or something? Just blowing people up. <laughs> like, was, not only was he not only did he grow up to be more just regular athletic than everyone else, he was also way stronger than everyone else too. And just way bigger. Yeah. He was all right, let's put this in, let's put this in perspective here. Put it in perspective. When he is an adult mm-hmm. at like seven feet tall, two he's somewhere between two fifty and three hundred pounds. Way bigger than the guys that are playing in the NFL at that time. And not to mention, I mean that's that's just a huge dude. Plus there are all these stories about Wilt's feats of strength. You know, yeah. even even Arnold himself talks about how how Wilt would walk into the same gym that he was in and, and just embarrass everyone. Yeah, I mean, the fact of that someone with arms the length of Wilt Chamberlain could bench press 500 I'm not kidding, pounds. 500 pounds is absolutely absurd. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. He's probably an alien. It, it, you know, he could be. I never know how he found his way to this flat earth of ours. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> On to Overbrook High School. Was he a ladies' man in high school? Absolutely we, not. We knew he was a prolific lover afterwards. Right. And that's the other thing is that that seems to be something that Wilt grew into. He was not the ladies' man as a young man. God, this reminds me of the story where his, his, his basketball coach, right, has to have a, a young lady come to the gym to, to dance with him to kind of help improve his uh, coordination, yeah. you might say. This is when he was rather, rather young. Um, but... If it it speaks knew. to the point. Speaks if they to the, only knew what was in his future. It speaks to the point that, you know, he wasn't able to kind of rope in a young lady to dance with him um, on his own. So He was awkward and shy. But maybe that was the start of it. Maybe, maybe that was like the first time he, he spit a little game and it, you know, flowered into something. <laughs> it I doesn't sound know. like it. Not according to Cherry. It sounds like he didn't, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get there until a little, little bit later. So we talked about the fact that Wilt was a little awkward with the ladies in high school. But despite that fact... Wilt had a great time in high school. Uh, we also talked about the fact, the, the era that, that Wilt was growing up in, it was not super great uh, to be an African-American in America, but Wilt's high school was, you know, Cherry describes his high school as a place that there wasn't a whole lot of racial discrimination, and Cherry sort of attributes that to the fact that 
class wise about everyone at Overbrook was was middle class. And also a lot of the the white students there were Jewish who were, you know, have traditionally been sort of seen as like second class citizen white people. And uh, so Cherry attributes that to the fact that Wilt sort of, I don't even know if I want to call it sheltered, but he just wasn't exposed to it necessarily as much as someone else from somewhere else. Yeah, it was probably in terms of <laughs> high schools that you could go to. It's probably about as, as good as it, you know, got in the uh 1950s you know this is around the time of brown versus the board of education so i mean i think wilt was was fortunate in that matter i mean his high school was was split about 60 40 60, 70 40. 30 yeah that's what that's what cherry says but also not to to give a false accounting the black kids you hung out with the black kids the white kids mostly hung out with the white kids but there just wasn't it doesn't seem to be as much tension as in other parts of the country and and when they did hang out you know there were cherry says there were some sometimes that they would like intermix at parties and and go to each other's houses and that sort of stuff it was mostly athletics that that brought people together yeah that sounds kind of common for that time yeah but so that was sort of the the social dynamic that Will grew up with in high school uh do you want to talk about how absolutely freakishly dominant he was as an athlete yeah so I mean, as you guys can imagine, when you're 6'11 in high school, fairly coordinated and probably stronger than most of your peers, you tend to dominate uh, in terms of athletics. Yeah, I mean, uh, he was even, he was skinny. Re- I mean, 6'11, 200 pounds. Yeah, so real rail skinny. Thin. Real skinny. And, uh, was he got like five pounds on you, Air? Just about. Like, I don't know, <laughs> maybe the 10 or 15, but I mean, still, I'm not 6'11. He's 10, you know, at least 10 inches on me. But I mean, even still, even if, even if he wasn't necessarily overpowering someone, a 6'11 person on a basketball court real hard to guard oh yeah especially, oh yeah especially for us me- mere mortals <laughs> and given the rules back then yeah definitely which we'll get into a little bit later uh so wilt was absolutely dominant in basketball and that's where he he gets the name wilt the stilt was from his his high school and days of just it. murdering kids but no as Arif is saying <laughs> <laughs> he, he actually hated it he hated the name Wilt the Stilt. He thought it was kind of a freak show, sideshow sounding name. Uh, and, it, and it kind of really brought attention to that height that he was a little bit and how thin he sub- was. Uh, self-conscious about. Yeah, and how thin he was. Uh, so it, he, he hated it. Um, what he preferred was the name The Big Dipper. And that came from the fact that because he was so tall, so young, that when he was in people's homes, he had to duck his head to he had go to through dip. doors. Yeah, he had to dip. Get and, up through the door. Yeah, but that was a nickname that he didn't really become popular until a little bit later, I don't believe. But, I mean, that was his nickname among his friends, but I just mean in terms of sports. He probably had to wage a, a lifelong campaign of, like, trying to eliminate the name Wilt the Stilt and, and getting people and to call me Dip. And yeah, mo- <laughs> he failed at Mostly, it. yeah, yeah. For, the, for the most part, because we still call him Wilt the Stilt. Yeah, so we're going to talk about how freakishly dominant Wilt was in high school, but keep in mind that all of these stats were only three years because... At the time, you really didn't play as a freshman. You, you didn't, period. Yeah. You didn't play as a freshman. And this is the same thing for his college career. It also makes his stats in, in college. And they ridiculous. don't record blocks. <sighs> Man, Which, can you imagine if they did? Yeah, I, can you, I wonder how many like quadruple doubles he would have had. All of them. He would have had <laughs> all of them. All of the quadruple doubles. I'll have two quadruple doubles, please. At least, at least triple doubles. I don't know. Will probably wasn't assisting a whole lot. But, I mean, goodness. Rebounds, points, blocks. Every game. Nuts. I mean, but he was, he, look, he was a capable passer, which we'll get into yeah. uh, later. But when he finally does step onto the floor, he's blowing the doors off of these kids. Um, and in his first year, they actually make it to the state championship, which, or the city championship, which is first they have their league yeah, championship. Yeah, the public school league. The Overbrook public school public. league. And then the public school league champion plays the champion of the like Catholic, Catholic, school, the Catholic league. school league, which I think the sense that I got was that typically the Catholic school league was better. Yeah, but uh, it's also important to to mention that that Overbrook was famous for oh, sports yeah. basketball. Like any one of you who who pay attention to basketball at all now probably know Oak Hill Academy, like Oak Hill, St. Vincent, St. Mary's, right? And that's sort of what Overbrook was back then. Yeah, because I mean. It was just a dominant school in the region, and Philadelphia was just a dominant city and, in the region. Yeah, because, again, it goes back to the fact that basketball is just in the veins of Philadelphia. And, and I remember Cherry talks about the fact that at one point, the Philadelphia Warriors put out a starting five of all Overbrook 
graduates in an NBA game, which is ridiculous. No, no, no. It was like they the the entire team was Wasn't made up of team? something like that, and they finished second in the yeah. NBA overall Wild. with just players from Philly. You know, today it's sort of a big deal in you know recording in 2017 for those of you listening to this in 10 years. No, this is 2018, bro. Oh shoot, this is 2018. Damn, where did the time go? <laughs> but anyway, now it's like a big deal whenever there's you know Kentucky yeah. alums that are all on you know there's like four Kentucky alums on this team, but that you know they were the best players in the country, a lot of them mm-hmm. in college, and we're talking about putting an entire NBA team of just people from one high school together. Right. It's nuts. I it mean, they, nuts. Were, they were playing on a high level. And in this championship game, despite being quadruple teamed, Wilt managed to score 29 points. Quadruple Which I think was teamed. two points below his average. Yeah. Which is nuts. Which is insane. I don't even quite understand. I don't understand what, what a quadruple team looks like. Is that like the box in one just with the, the, the box being always around Wilt Chamberlain? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I would love to see what this looks like. Because, I mean... I can't even imagine from a defensive perspective how what, that How do you win a game that way? I I don't know. I mean there was no three point line, so I guess you yeah, you yeah. you put four people on Wilt and one guy guarding the paint, maybe. Yeah, I just I I don't <laughs> understand it. It's not computing right now, man. Yeah. Insane. Uh, but so they lost they lost that one. Yeah. They lost that one, which was which was tough for them. But But they came back with a vengeance. They came back. For Wilt's junior year. Where they win the city championship. And, and a senior year. They but win it in a senior year. And also, let's, let's throw this stat line out there. In his senior year, he puts up in three consecutive games a score line of 74, 78, and 90. What are we talking about? Good high school basketball players wouldn't put those numbers up maybe even in an entire season. I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. Like, in... Where I played high school, that I'm sorry, did not play. Where I did not play high school basketball, but where I where I <laughs> watched high school, I, yeah, where I attended high school was in uh, northeast, northwest Ohio, and also known dude, as Michigan. Uh, watch your mouth, Toledo. We won the war, Detroit. You guys know what I'm talking about. the The final score of games was like 35, 37. You know, like Will Chamberlain in this 90 point game had like three three games worth of points for an entire team. Yeah. And we played some ball. Yeah. At the high school that I went to in Northeast Ohio. Pennsylvania. <laughs> pretty much. Not, not far. You know, we had some really good players, and it was a, you know, it's a huge deal to be in the 1,000-point club, to have scored 1,000 points over your four-year career. And, <laughs> and Wilt is <laughs> When you're putting here. up 90-point games, how right. quickly can you get there? And, and, and it's only three years. You know what I mean? And, and so right. that takes us to his, his varsity stat line, which is in the three years that Wilt played oh. varsity – he had a record of 56 and 3 and he's and he set the scoring record with 2252 points averaging 37 a game. Dude, he probably if he played as a freshman, he probably could have scored 3000 points. He probably did. That's that yeah, mind blown. And imagine the blocks. I don't even want to imagine how many blocks he was getting in high school. That was probably absurd. Yeah, so that pretty much wraps up Wilt's high school career, but while he was in high school, over the summers he would spend time at uh, working at this country club in the uh, the Catskill Mountains. Catskill, owned by a family named Kutcher, and it was their their resort. And so he actually became extremely close with them, and he would stay close with them throughout his entire life. But while he was there, one benefit besides earning some money and you know getting out and meeting new people. Gaining a family. The, there were other resorts in the Catskills, and, and a lot of college basketball players would go and work there in the summer to earn some money, too. And so these resorts would put together their own basketball teams. And so while Wilt was still in high school, he got to compete against some of the, the country's best NCAA talent. And uh, there's a funny story that Cherry talks about in his book of a uh, player named B.H. Horn, who had uh, just come up. He was on Kentucky's national championship team and he had won the MVP for the tournament and Wilt was there and by the way Wilt was being coached by none other than perhaps the greatest basketball coach of all time Red Auerbeck and Cherry sort of says that that Auerbeck kind of hyped Wilt up like you know this is one of the the best players in the country and and they played the same position they were both centers and so so Wilt absolutely rips born apart and at the time Bourne was considering playing in the NBA. 
and he just decided after that, he's like, no, I can't do it. If there are kids, high school kids in this part of the country who are doing this to me, I'm not going to last. And so he ends up taking a, <laughs> taking a, a job with Caterpillar. Which, which, yeah, pretty good job. But can you imagine someone turning down the NBA today? I'm just saying, like, will actually ruin a man's career? Well, here's the thing. That's what the greats do. It's like Vince Carter, who jumped over that, uh, the French guy, Frederick Weiss, yeah. Weiss, who and he's just like, you know what? Done. Don't want to go to the NBA. No. No? Absolutely ridiculous. The dunk de la mort. So after Will was done ruining at least one man's career, he goes back to high school, continues his domination for his senior year, and, you know, by this point, he had already attracted the eye of pretty much the entire country in terms of uh, recruiting for college. So he was recruited by 200 plus schools and offered officially by 120 from all over the country. And a lot of these scouts were getting real creative with the way that they tried to attract Wilt to uh, come to their school. We had, you know, schools in California like UCLA telling Wilt that he would be a movie star if he came there. Other schools were telling him that if he attended their school, they would not only make sure he got his undergraduate ed- education, but they would make sure that he was in their med school or their law school, which is sort of terrifying to think about. <laughs> that they were going to put Wilt through medical school just for playing basketball. This is why we need the NCAA. Exactly. <laughs> there was also the, the NBA, which at the time was, was much different. It's sort of hard to imagine the NBA as, as playing second fiddle to the NCAA because yeah. you know now the NBA is a global brand, but it certainly wasn't then. And so... In an attempt to capitalize on the popularity of uh, local college stars, the NBA had a territorial draft in addition to the regular draft. Any team could give up its first-round pick in exchange for the right to draft a college player from a university as long as they were within a 50-mile radius of that team. And a team could exercise territorial rights on a player at a university further than 50 miles away if no other team was closer. With Wilt, due to graduate in high school, Eddie Gottlieb, owner of the Philadelphia Warriors, convinced the NBA owners to change the territorial draft rules to include high school players. And in 1955, he invoked the territorial draft to select Wilt four years in advance of the 1959 season, the first year that uh, Wilt would be eligible to, to play because at the time the NCAA and the NBA had rules that no player could play in the NBA game sooner than four years after he graduated from high school. And actually, that was the first of many rules that would change due to Will Chamberlain. So Will was drafted by the Philadelphia Warriors, but he still had four years until he could play. So it came down to having to play in college. So Wilt decided, uh, for a number of reasons, that he wanted to, to attend school in the Midwest. The mighty, mighty Midwest. We ain't afraid of no coast. <laughs> And this, this came down to a few, a few reasons. First, he didn't want to go to school in a big city. So that ruled out, you know, New York. Pretty much the uh, whole. Pretty much. New England. The New England area. Because there weren't really like colleges that had notable programs outside of New England. And uh, he also didn't want to go to school in the South for I wonder obvious, why. obvious reasons. <laughs> we, can't, we can only speculate. Yeah. The West Coast didn't really have a lot in terms of basketball all schools at the time uh, to offer. So he ends up settling on which this is kind of ironic about the west coast they weren't really good teams but while Wilt was in college they started to blow up another another notable player who would come into Wilt's life bill russell big bill was in san francisco tearing it up getting ready to win a national championship yeah and i i don't remember i think they they did overlap like one or two years when they would have been there oh uh, really so can you imagine had had wilt chamberlain decided he was going to go play for san francisco I'd had Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. They would have had the twins. It would have been nuts. Ridiculous. But yeah. anyway, and I digress. Anyway, ultimately, he ends up settling on the University of Kansas. He was recruited by Coach Fogg Allen. So when uh, Coach Allen, if you guys don't know this, he, he's a legend in the, the college basketball world. Fogg but, Allen. And in the basketball world <laughs> in general. And with a great name like Fogg, you know, because you can't of his, go Because wrong. of his voice. They, they called him Fogg because of how loud he was. <laughs> Sound like a foghorn. Foghorn. Yeah. And, and the thing is, too, that Wilt didn't actually want to go to Kansas at first. Like, he was, he was not super interested, but... He took a visit. Yeah. I mean, he was encouraged to take the visit because, you know, legendary they, Coach Fogg Allen was... And was they, showed up, they showed up. They showed up with tickets. plane tickets. Yeah. You know? So at, when Fogg came to visit, or uh, Coach Allen came to visit, he, he pretty much stuck closely to, to Wilt's mother, yeah. which is... It's classic move. Can't go wrong. When the parents, you get the kid. Yep. And, and like Eric said, Wilt wasn't particularly interested in KU, which I believe I called the University of Kansas before. 
all those Jayhawk fans out there, please forgive me. <laughs> um, he goes on the visit, and actually, you know, due to some bad weather, he ends up getting in <laughs> 3 a.m. at 3 a.m., and there's still 50 people waiting yeah, to well, greet that was, him. Yeah, well, that was Fog Allen's doing. You know, he wanted to make sure, he wanted to, to paint Lawrence, Kansas as a, uh, as a wonderful, friendly place for, Cosmo. for a uh, young African-American basketball player and so he had business leaders from the the community both black and white they're waiting for him to paint this picturesque picture for wilt and uh really i think that boosted um wilt's impression of of lawrence but a, another major selling point Speaking for of boosters <laughs> selling point for him attending the uh ku was he was on the payroll oh he sure was Right, but you know, know, and and that's not to say that he wouldn't have been anywhere else. Oh, he was on the payroll everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, anyone was going to pay Wilt to come and play there, and KU was no different. So, one thing that's interesting about Wilt and his time in Lawrence is that he effectively started to change segregation in in Lawrence. Yeah, and important to point out that Lawrence, Kansas, was very different from Philadelphia. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine uh, what the differences could have been. <laughs> but but he got that exposure right away, real on, quick. On his first on his first trip down, him and a uh, white teammate from Overbrook, who were both going to be playing at KU, stopped to get some uh, some sandwiches in Mistake Kansas. Mistake number one. Yeah, and uh, Will was was promptly told that he could uh, he could take his sandwich out back and eat. Yeah, there's like, like was there a back room or was it like outside? I think it was just outside, and uh, Will Will lost it. And yeah, he, he was, wasn't happy about no, that. No, he wasn't. And when he got to Fog Allen's house. He was like, you know what? I ain't standing for this. I'm going home. And I almost did. And uh, Fog Allen talked him down. And he said, you know what? It's I pulled some different. strings. Yeah. It's going to be different here. Um, so basically, this, you know, rinse and repeat. This happened a number of times during Wilt's time in Lawrence where, you know, say it was a, a movie theater or something. He wasn't welcomed uh, in. And basically, he would, he would complain to Fog Allen or, or university or the administrators. Dean, or the, the chancellor, I think it was. That he had like a direct line to the... To the chancellor, according to Jerry. And basically what would happen from there is whatever, you know, the dean needed to do to make sure that this was no longer an issue, he would do it. Um, yeah, because, I mean, important to note, too, that Lawrence is a college town. So, right. you know, the town goes as, as the college go. And so influential figures like, like the chancellor of the university or, or Fog Allen, like, they carried a lot of weight. A lot of weight. And yeah. if they show up and say, hey, you know, you got this segregated lunch counter, it's not segregated anymore. Yeah, and, and it's also interesting, too, though, that Wilt, in his complaining, was getting things changed, which did benefit other African Americans in the community, but he wasn't doing it for he them. He wasn't, he was not a champion. He was champion not leading any marches. Of, uh, yeah, he, he was no MLK. Yeah. Uh, basically, you know, at least in, as it comes out in the biography that we read, he, you know, he was doing it mostly for himself. He wasn't going to be treated this way. And if that helped out, you know, the other African Americans living in Lawrence, Great, but his primary concerns seem to be uh, with himself. Yeah, and I mean, because I'll, I'll read this quote from the from the book that Cherry quotes one of Wilt's teammates who had actually played at Overbrook too, and then followed Wilt down to Kansas. I think the year a year or two afterwards, and his name was Al Carell, and he said about Wilt, he would go to the he would go to Chancellor Murphy and say, "If you don't straighten this out, I'm leaving." But Wilt wasn't thinking in terms of all African Americans. He was saying, "I'm not going to be treated like that. I'm not going to sit up there." meaning the uh, segregated movie theaters. Of course, it had an impact for the rest of us African-Americans, but what he did, he did largely for himself. So besides changing the racial landscape of Lawrence, Kansas, and the way that he did, Wilt also played a little ball. And just like in high school, he wasn't able to play varsity until his sophomore year. Uh, so he was on the strictly freshman team. And the most probably competitive game that Wilt was going to play as a freshman was the the scrimmage between the freshman and the the varsity team. And as you can expect, in most cases, the varsity team just wiped the floor with the freshman. They had never won. And Wilt, Wilt came out right away, and he let everyone, at least at Kansas, know that he was here to win. And for the first time in school history, the, the freshman actually ended up beating the varsity team with Wilt out there. And again, I bet this made Allen feel a little, a little sad he couldn't play Wilt on the varsity team. And speaking of Allen... The whole, well, I shouldn't say the whole reason, but a large part of the reason that Wilt came, Allen was turning 70 Wilt's freshman year. And the reason that is relevant is because at the time, uh, the university had a rule that any faculty or staff member had to retire the year following their 70th birthday. And so 
Fog Allen, who you know we mentioned was was an icon pretty much at the time, figured he would be able to get around that rule, and he figured wrong, and so he was forced to retire. And uh, his one of his assistant coaches, Dick Harp, ended up taking over the team. But but really, what this means is that Wilt, who had come to Kansas to play for Allen, never got to, and he really resented Harp for that, which is totally unfair. <laughs> I kind of see that like that picture of them trying to force Allen into retirement playing out like like training day when like the guys don't <laughs> want to do what 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 Denzel Washington's character wants them to do where he's like I am KU <laughs> <laughs> you know um so before Will even got to play varsity ball they were already changing the rules of the game in anticipation of Wilt's arrival so just to to go over this cuz it's it's hard to overstate the fact that a player like Wilt had never been seen at this point. There had never yeah. been this level of dominance. This is the real unicorn. Seriously, you know? This is at least the first unicorn. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The, it, so the first rule was offensive goaltending, which prior to Wilt getting there, apparently you could do. Which if you don't, if you guys, if, if you don't follow basketball, goaltending is when the ball, in this case, is on the cylinder or above the, or above the cylinder. cylinder. What you were able to do before was you could smack the ball off of the cylinder. Now you can still do no, 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 this. No, that's defensive. Offensive. Oh, it, offensive yeah, yeah. On your teammate shot, was able shot. to just grab the ball off the rim and put it back and in. put it back in. So when you see all those fancy put back dunks, those guys nowadays they have to time it so that the ball is coming off of the cylinder. Yeah, but for Wilt and for Wilt's teammates. They could just shoot whatever just they want. Just throw it up. Will yeah. to clean it up. Yeah, because if you hit the rim, it didn't matter because Will could just grab it and dunk it. Now, in Europe, you can still do this today. But in the United States, you haven't been able to do this since Wilt Chamberlain. The other rule, which is also ridiculous, is dunking your foul shots. Yeah. So basically what Wilt would do, because he was a notoriously bad... This all-star game move. ...free throw shooter, yeah. He would just chuck the ball at the rim and then run immediately because you did... He'd immediately run and dunk the ball into the rim as it was coming back towards him. Today, you can't. Now, what they, they, they implemented was you cannot cross that free throw line until the ball reaches the rim. Yeah, and there was no consequence because, again, men, like Melvin just said, Wilt was a terrible free throw shooter, but it didn't matter because he could shoot his first free throw and miss, and then, so no points, but then shoot his second one run in the lane and just dunk it and still get the two points anyway right and whoever's shooting it obviously has an advantage because they're shooting the ball they know when the ball is leaving their hands and they know where it's going exactly and the last one which is (laughs) again ridiculous is on the inbounds play you used to be able to lob the ball over the basket and basically wilt being six foot eleven seven ten by this time, seven, seven ten. I'm sorry, yeah. seven <laughs> feet, seven feet tall. By this time, he was able to just out jump everyone, grab the ball, put it in. This obviously needed to be changed, and it was. Yeah, and this wasn't necessarily before Wilt played varsity, but this happened before at some point during his college career. And I know this rule was implemented before Wilt ever played it uh, professionally. The basketball gods changed the rules to uh, widen the lane just because they oh a number of times yeah twice at least twice because they needed to they needed to keep wilt as far away from the paint as possible so if you don't know there's what we call three in the key in basketball you cannot sit in that painted area under the basket for more than three seconds um without without being called for a violation so basically each time they widen the lane they're keeping wilt further and further away from the basket which obviously benefits the other team because can you imagine how easy it would have been for Wilt and again I feel like I keep saying this but he was so dominant not only was he just better than everyone he was so much more athletic than the people he was playing against yeah and that, and this is one thing this this brings me on to a point you know a lot of times we all we always want to say like the modern athlete is clearly better than you know any athlete that was before one better than Wilt one better than there's a few there's like Wilt Chamberlain Bo Jackson like these dudes Somehow, without lifting, well, Bo without lifting weights, but like these dudes were just aliens, man. Yeah. Aliens. Yeah. Uh, so Wilt was just absolutely dominant. And I think he'd probably still even be dominant today. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt. So that brings us up to Wilt's varsity career. So he debuted against Northwestern on December 3rd, 1956. And for anyone in the country who had any questions about what Wilt was about to do, do to them for the next few years, he just put 52 points 
on them and uh, grabbed 31 rebounds. Probably blocked like 40 shots, but again, the NCAA didn't start tracking that for a while. 52 and 31, that's it? Hmm. Hmm. Weak game. Weak yeah. I expected game. more from Wilt. Disappointing, Wilt. So it quickly became very clear to the rest of the NCAA that trying to play Kansas's game was going to just result in loss after loss after loss. And what Kansas would do is they would use Wilt's ridiculous athleticism and his, his incredible conditioning, by the way. Wilt never came out of games. He played the whole time, ran. And ran like a gazelle. Yeah, and was outrunning people from tip to final buzzer. And so teams were like, we can't possibly run with this guy. And so what they did was they would just hold the ball for as long as they could. And That old high school tactic. It must have been so frustrating for Wilt because then when Wilt got the ball, they just foul the crap out of him because now you Bug can box him. him out. Yeah, because now you can box him out uh, on his free throws. So teams would just slow the game down as much as possible and just physically do their, you know, do their best to, to manhandle Wilt as best they could. I mean, it's, it's worth pointing out that the game was different back then from what it is now. People, it, it was just a, a physical, it was really for physical. those guys down there, it was, it was physical. Yeah, and not to mention the fact that, you know, if you just foul somebody every possession, the refs aren't going to call it. They're not going to call a foul every time down the floor. So they just, teams would play against Wilt and just hack the crap out of him immediately. And live with him shooting free throws. Yeah. So this, I mean, this could have been an early, you know, forerunner to the hack shack <laughs> Exactly. So in 1957, we're going to move on to, to Wilt's first tournament appearance. You know, today, March Madness is, is enormous and crazy. But in 1957, it was a little different. Only 23 teams competed. And you had to, the only way you got in was by winning your conference. And Kansas did. So that year, the Midwest Regional was held in Dallas, which was still segregated. And Coach Harp was made aware by the NCAA tournament committee that they were not going to be allowed to stay in the tournament, the official tournament hotel with African-American players on their team. And, you know, Harp catches some flack as a coach, mostly because Will didn't like him. But one thing I'll say about him, he was not putting up with any of this discrimination stuff. He refused to stay in the hotel. They actually stayed outside of Dallas in Grand Prairie, which wasn't any better, but they at least were able to find accommodations that would, would allow the entire team to stay together. But even still, they had to, you know, eat all their meals in the hotel and just police escorts wherever they went. Yeah, and, and it was really ugly. And when they played in Dallas, it was it was even more ugly. They, you know, they had to deal with with taunts and Yeah, racial slurs, tr- things being thrown at them during the game. Yeah, and so I mean that really speaks to the the ability of this team and their their mental toughness that they that they went in there and they they won both of their regional games and that win didn't make things any better for them in terms of the uh, the treatment they were receiving. They had the that's one of those win and get out of town games. Seriously, and they did. They had to have a uh, police escort to to keep fans from attacking the bus. So having won in Dallas, the Jayhawks head on to the Final Four where they first beat the University of San Francisco, who had previously been led by. One Bill Russell, but he had gone on to the NBA, and so they were not what they used to be. They got absolutely worked by Wilt's uh, Jayhawks, and then they go to the championship against the Tar Heels, and Wilt has an excellent game and puts an MVP performance, but the Tar Heels still win in uh, third overtime. And uh, this game was really hard for Kansas, you know, it had been an emotional ride, especially coming through Dallas the way they did. But throughout Wilt's life, he would look at this particular loss as, as one of the hardest that he ever he ever had to deal with. It also started Wilt's legacy, a dubious legacy in my opinion, as a great single player, but not a great winner or a great team performer. After his sophomore season, Wilt is also having to deal with all these rumors that he's going to leave KU. I guess it was sort of known that Wilt wasn't thrilled with playing at KU. He really didn't like the the way teams were playing against him and that sort of thing. But he did end up coming back for his junior year where he had just another monster season, despite more and more teams playing the slow the game down and just beat the crap out of Wilt style of basketball. He was still able to average 30 a game. And he also, it was just really a frustrating season for him. You know, by this time, he had become a little more comfortable with the ladies. and uh, A little bit. Just a little. So he, he was developing a, a reputation around campus. Slight, not nearly, not nearly as prolific as he would become. But he had a UTI, a urinary tract infection. And it ended up being, uh, you know, it caused him to also have a, a swollen testicle, which he had to miss time for. And rumors 
went around that, that Wilt actually had picked up the clap. And so, <laughs> and so one, of the, one of the games, the opposing fans took to calling Wilt the Big Dripper, uh-huh. which, is a, uh, which is a play on the Big Dipper and, and absolutely wonderful, in my opinion. I'll tell you what, man. College fans can really... Ah. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, furthering Wilt's, Wilt's frustration his junior year, he, you know, Kansas ends up missing the tournament. What sort of black magic allows them to miss the tournament? How did that happen? I remember them actually having what what most would consider a fairly successful season, but you know I think the way that teams got into the tournament back then, I think it was a much smaller. You had uh, to tournament. win your conference. Yeah, I forget exactly how, but they they end up despite having a good season, like a quote unquote good season, just ended up not winning their conference, and so they missed the tournament altogether. Shout out to the uh, playoff committee, college football. You know, I I really think we need to go back to that. You know what? Win your conference, get in. That's right. Uh, because, yeah, they ended up losing five games, which uh, put them out of, you know, they, they weren't able to win their conference with that record. Right. But so after his junior season, Wilt does decide that he's going to leave. At this point, you know, he was, I would say, world famous, even though basketball was a much smaller world then. But he was, he was extremely famous among anyone who paid any sort of attention to, to basketball at all by this point. And so he sold the rights to his announcement that he was going to leave Kansas to Look Magazine. Uh, they paid him $10,000, which doesn't sound like, I mean, well, actually, it sounds like a lot of money to me. I'd take it. <laughs> right, but not not to someone like Wilt, who, you know, is going to be a professional athlete making all his money and stuff. But at the time, that was a ton of money. Not only, you know, if you calculate for inflation and that sort of thing, but at that time, players who played professionally weren't making $10,000 per season. You know, the average salary in the NBA in 1957 was, was around $9,000 a season. So for Wilt to, you know, this college player to, to make 10000 before he even does anything professionally, it's pretty impressive. So I just crunched the numbers. Adjusted for inflation, $10,000. What year was this? 1957. Okay, so I, I did this for 1960. Let me actually, I'll just go ahead and adjust it here uh, right now. But I mean, even still. Let's, let me just throw this out there. 1957, $10,000 is the equivalent of $87,000 today. Which, to me, again, sounds like a ton of money. A great salary. Just to say, hey, I'm leaving school. It's crazy to think about, even though that's a lot of money, the difference between the kind of money that NBA players get now. Because Right. You know what I mean? Like It was $9,000 was the average then. Compared to whatever, I mean, I don't know what the average is today, but like you think about the highest, oh play, highest paid players in the NBA then were getting paid like 10. There's guys that I hardly know in the NBA that are getting like $100 million contracts. They're handing out money right Rid- now like it's Monopoly money. Ridiculous. Was it like LeBron gets like 31 a year or 31 million a year or something like that? Yeah, yeah. It, no, something ridiculous. I can't even, I mean, listen, I love Mike Conley, but there was a point in time. He was a highest A very player. short moment over the summer where Mike Conley was the highest paid player and Mike Conley is a great guard, but Go he's making like two hundred plus million. Go Bucks. Go what? Go Bucks. Oh yeah, Ohio State. That's right. I, I, I was in the NBA mode, and I was like, "Why are we talking about?" Well, you were Milwaukee? in Michigan fan mode. Whatever. You know what? All right, moving on. So anyway, Wilt wraps up his college career at Kansas, and I just think it's important to bookend this by letting you all know about some of the stats that he was putting up, or that he ended up putting up uh, in his time at Kansas. He set university records for single season game scoring with fifty two rebounds with 36 made field goals 20 and free throws which is hard to believe <laughs> how bad he was but he had 18 so those were all single game then he had highest scoring average in a single season and career with 30.1 and 29.9 respectively and highest single season and career rebounding average with 18.9 and 18.3 respectively and again we've talked about this a few times already but they didn't record blocks and Wilt was a block machine. There were people who, who had watched Wilt play live who think that Wilt probably averaged at least 10 blocks a game. So adjusted for reality, he probably had seven? Uh, no. Like, I, <laughs> I don't even doubt it. I don't even doubt that he, that he had double digits. There's a guy who used to keep stats for the Philadelphia Warriors who did keep track of blocks even though yeah. it wasn't an official stat. And, he had, and Wilt had 25 in one game. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I know it's hard to believe. I'll be like, Coach, take me out. I'm not shooting anymore. It's hard to imagine because, like, the baseline level of freakishly athletic people playing the NBA now. But, like, at the time, they weren't all that athletic. Yeah, and I also want to point out, if you haven't already done this, get on YouTube and just pull up Watch a video clip. Watch grainy old videos. The grainy old 
video of Wilt Chamberlain doing things that humans should not be able to do. Like, I mean, grab the top of the backboard. Just watching him block a shot that literally was at the top of the backboard. Is absolutely insane. I mean, I, look, I've watched DeAndre Dor- Jordan. He does some great blocks, but this seemed even, even higher than I've seen DeAndre Jordan get up there. Yeah. It's crazy. Incredible. But as we'll discuss, the next chapter of Wilt's life, which is professional basketball, he decides to, to head on over and play with the Harlem Globetrotters. But that's actually where we're going to stop this episode, and we will pick up next time with episode two of Wilt Chamberlain from his pro career. Making some money. That's right, through the end of his life. So thank you all for tuning in, and we will catch you next time. All right. Thank you. Hey, guys, just a quick message before you take off. Please remember to subscribe. Leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. It really helps get the word out about Life of X. Don't forget to tell a friend. And if you're interested in supporting the show in any other way, please head over to thelifeofxpodcast.com and click on our support page. Thank you. Thank you.